And hi everyone, welcome to You Learn Chat, where you always learn something new. I am joined today by my good friend from Scotland. She lives in England now, Leslie Price. She's with www.learnappeal.org.uk. You can also get there with learnappeal.com. Learn Appeal is a great charity. You're seeing the website now. They do good work. Take a look at it and uh, get involved. It, it's really a, a good charity uh, in, in parts of the world that are really needed, frankly. Leslie, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Well, this morning when I woke up, we actually had some snow. I, I heard the ba back east here and in parts of Europe, still snow, almost in March. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it make, it, well, it's better than flooding. That's true. <laughs> that is true. Until the <laughs> snow melts and then you got flooding again. Yeah. But <laughs> Exactly. Anyway, and joining us today also co-hosting is Harold Mugliotti. Today, Leslie's in the hot seat. She's going to be talking oh. all about the Learning Technology Show and what's been going on over there. Here we go. This show is sponsored by Relate Corporation at www.relate.com, your training and video partner. Hello, I'm Peter Baker. Please visit voiceovermasterclass.com to see details of the training courses I have on offer for new and existing voice talents to further their career by enhancing voice and technical skills as well as essential marketing tips. And by the way, Peter Baker is a great guy. Take a take a listen to his course. He's on Udemy, and it's a great set. Of, he's got several courses out there on voiceover, on learning audition. It's great. And, and by the way, we have our first course on Udemy, too, uh, called Sounding Great, Audio Basics for E-Learning and more. Take a look at that. You'll have fun with that course as well. Leslie, how did the show go for you? Well, I'm just going to interrupt a little bit at the beginning there because when you were talking about Peter Baker, yes. one of the things, one of the things when I was a little girl, I moved from Glasgow to Edinburgh. And Glasgow, they were a wee bit, you know, they talked was a wee bit rough and you couldn't always understand what people were saying. And so when I moved to Edinburgh, my mother sent me to elocution lessons. Mm -hmm. And that was how I learned to speak properly. Properly. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, now, would you say yeah, the Glasgow? The show, would would you sorry? say the Glasgow accent is a little more? No, Irish it's not sounded? Glasgow, Rick. It's not Back. Glasgow. 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 Uh, do you think that's a little more Irish sounding? It's um, it's just a bit. It's a bit more, it's a bit less English. I don't know if it's more Irish. Hmm. It's just a bit, whereas Edinburgh is slightly what you would call posher. I just know I've seen a lot of videos of people from <laughs> Glasgow getting uh, angry at their Amazon uh, Alexas and that sort of thing because they're not yeah. understanding them. Mm. And, and when they <laughs> when they try to like put on an English accent, then it starts to understand them and they, they start getting over that. Yeah. Well, it's like when I was at when I was at the Learning Technologies Awards, there were so many people talking, and I was meant to be there speaking, and I eventually banged my hand on the um, on the rostrum, and I said, "And see you lot out there, just had your wished." <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a good which, one. Which means just hold your shh. So be quiet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's it's just and if you ask my, I mean my children use that term, but even though they were born in England, they use that term a lot. Hmm. Um, and you say you tend to talk about. How's it going, pal? So if you want to hear a Glasgow accent, Billy Connolly is the mm. one that has the the Glasgow accent. And he has you know, quite a lot of shows that yeah. you can hear the the Glasgow accent. But no, Learning Technologies was was great. It was incredibly busy, 
very, very, very busy. Um, but, you know, amazing. And at the very beginning here on the show, I have to thank the organizers uh, that you met, Rick, um, mm -hmm. Mark Penton and Ian Smout from Closer Still, who always give Learn Appeal um, a, a free stand at the event. So we yep. never have to pay to attend the event. And Don Taylor, who chairs the event, always gives us mentions from the main stage at the conference. So I need to say a big thank you to the organizers of the event for allowing us um, space and to attend, because I think it says a lot that they are willing to do that. They've been because, very supportive you know, and, and that is nice is to see. Yeah. 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 But no, it was, it was busy. We set up on the Tuesday evening and also on the Tuesday evening, there was um, a networking event mm -hmm. that was run by the Fosway group. I don't know if you come across the Fosway group. I know them. And in fact, one of the girls works there that was on the show. What was her name? Um, didn't somebody? Kate Graham. Kate. Kate worked there. Kate. Yeah. Yeah. Kate works there. Uh, so Kate Graham works there. She's head of content at the Fosway Group. And the Fosway Group ran an event the night before just to allow people to network and chat and talk. Um, so that was the night you know, before the event so that people could actually have a, a little bit of relaxed time. Yep. <laughs> was that at the, the, was that the, at the main... pub across the street from the Excel? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, at that's the Fox, a nice place. Uh, Excel. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. At the Fox at XL. Yep. Very First. Nice. And Foxway, uh, Foxway um, are bringing out a number, I've brought out a number of reports. Um, so, and I'm going to try and get, um, you know, either one, either one of the Davids, David Wilson or David Perring, who, you know, run Fosway, mm -hmm. um, onto the show to talk about what they're doing with their research because it's absolutely fascinating hmm. absolutely fascinating and is getting more and more and more credibility within the industry that's good and leslie you were telling us before the show that it it, it was considerably bigger this year compared to last year yes to me the there were far there were far more people there it seemed that it was just absolutely chaotic. <laughs> so last year, when, when Rick and Leslie were there, you know, there was time where they could wander off and um, I didn't have to, you know, and even if I left the stand and went to talk to somebody, I didn't have to worry because we weren't always totally inundated. This year, we had queues <laughs> at the stand. <laughs> Wow. And and on you know, and when you walked round the event, it wasn't just our stand that there were queues at. There were queues across the board. It was a very, very, very busy, busy event. No, that's good. And and there's a lot of room in front of your stand for people to queue up. So I can only imagine yeah. that you have like five, six people deep and, and they're hitting almost the other side of the hallway. Yeah. So that's good. That's a that's a yeah. good problem. And this year we actually on day one, um, we invited a charity that we're working with called Dopsy, which is diabetes open prevention program. I can't remember exactly what DOPSY stands for. Um, I'll put, I'll give Harold a link, but we were working with DOPSY. It's a diabetes outreach program, hmm. and we have got about 12 or 14 volunteers who are currently <laughs> creating content that we can put on the capsules to help people hmm. in... Um, countries where they don't have access to training they don't have access to learning to learn all about how they manage diabetes particularly type 2 diabetes yes. so people who either have type 2 diabetes themselves or otherwise look after people with type 2 diabetes 
That's actually really and good. diabetes is a huge, you know, it, it it is a huge problem for many many people. Oh yeah, purely worldwide. because they don't understand how to manage it. No, and, and the other thing is, there's a lot of myth about diabetes, pro probably pushed pushed by pharma and others, but it's totally reversible, especially in type two. Um, yeah, there's a lot of ways you can reverse it, and they don't like to they don't like to push that because the medicines they give you aren't all that good. They can make you feel pretty sick. There's a lot of natural things you can do to actually totally reverse, including some lifestyle changes. Don't eat so much sugar, yeah. you know, all all the little things. But um, yeah, that's a that's great. That's a real good thing. So this, yeah. so they're going to create content, or are are you folks creating content for them? Um, I'm just giving Harold. I've just typed the link into the um, chat box so that Harold can actually pull up um, their website. What's happening is that they have lots and lots and lots of content, but it's all either in PDF format or it's in PowerPoint format or Word documents, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But they want to make it interactive oh, content nice. so <laughs> that we can use it on the capsule and people can learn. Yeah, that's it. And the person that we had working with us who was on the stand was um, Anna, who is the founder of um, the charity. That's great. And I say Anna is doing an awful lot with this charity. And what we want to do is to help them. No, that's really good. We want to help. So, and, and again, yeah, there you go, because, learn appeal, helping other people help themselves. Yeah, and that's yeah. the whole thing about what we're doing, Rick. That the, the whole thing, as you know, with learn appeal is we want to help people help themselves. Mm -hmm. It's not about us telling them. No, imagine telling that, right? Telling people what to do. Yeah, imagine yeah. that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's interesting, but it's, it's, you know what, it's so simple and so commonsensical that people probably think, well, huh, what? Um, but it's true. You keep people, like you said in the beginning, we don't want you running away from your country. We want you helping your country, uh, doing yeah. things to help your community and everybody around you. You know, a lot of countries yeah. are hard to live in, and there's a lot of, of bad things going on all over the world. But on the other hand, if you get a good groundswell of people willing to put the effort in to help make their countries better, wow, imagine the changes that could make. Well, Especially yeah. in health. Yes. Yeah, and, you know, in, in the future, you could pre prevent the problem that glo globalism tends to create, where, you know, if you have one country, only one country that's really good at doing a certain thing, and something happens in that country, then everyone else is out of luck. Whereas if you if you're able if we create strong economies all across the world, then there there we are all more, benefit. Yeah, we all everyone benefit. will benefit. Actually, it's sort of interesting what's going on right now with the coronavirus or the uh, COVID nineteen virus. It's a perfect example of globalism gone bad. Everybody puts everything into one country. One country has a major issue, and the supply chain disappears. You can't get yeah. products here. You can't get products in Europe. 75% uh, of the Chinese workers are refusing to go back to work right now. And that's at gunpoint they're refusing to go back. They're, no, they're not going to do it until they feel safe. And they can't kill everybody. They, they like to kill a lot of people, but they can't kill everybody. And it's just sad. It's just sad seeing it, and we're all going to pay for it. And, and there's a lot of you know, theories that that's going to spread everywhere. Now, it's not as bad a virus as people think. If you're healthy, you'll probably continue being healthy. But it is affic afflic afflicting older people. This and not so much younger. Yeah. It's afflicting old people, and it's got... What what is it a two percent death rate, which doesn't sound like a lot, which is but an it, awful lot. But which it is, is an awful lot. lot less than it's an awful lot less than the flu. Yes, an awful lot less than the yeah. flu. Yeah, uh, but it's nasty. In other words, if it does get you, it, it's a pretty quick death. It's not they're not lasting that long, uh, and they said yeah. there's a lot of lesions on the lungs and everything. So it's a very quick virus. And and again, the other stuff we're hearing a lot of is that. 
it was probably military grade. It was an accident. It got released, and they're they're like, "What do we do now?" Um, it's not good. It, it's definitely not good, and we're seeing the effects of it in the U.S. People can't get products, um, and and also to a certain point, it it highlights the greed of capitalism. Where capitalism, I'm, I'm a capitalist, but I don't believe you have to be greedy to be a good capitalist. Everybody well, goes for cheap do, labor. You know, all you've got to do is yeah. look at what has happened mm -hmm. to the various um, stock exchanges. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Worldwide. Yep. And they've all been hit. I mean, one of the things with, you know, when, when I think about Learn Appeal, one of the countries that I absolutely loved, loved, loved visiting as a teenager was what was then Rhodesia is mm. now Zimbabwe. Yes. <laughs> it was the bread basket of Africa. Okay, it was run by white farmers, but the white farmers genuinely cared, genuinely cared for the people that worked for them. They put schools, they gave the, the workers a house, a small piece of land, they gave them, put schools on the farms. They put health centers on the farms. Rhodesia was the breadbasket of Africa. And now it's, it's struggling. It's, and I, yeah. just, I, I just used to travel there and the people, and there wasn't the same apartheid in what was Rhodesia that existed in South Africa. Right. It, it just, it wasn't, it was very different. And I just think, I mean, I would love, I would love, love, love for Learn Appeal to do projects in um, Zimbabwe. But at the moment, I'm afraid it's too corrupt. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and, other part, and, and it's interesting because other parts of Africa are growing in leaps and bounds. Yeah. And Absolutely. nobody talks about that. And you know, you know, very few people talk about that. By the way, I'd like to recommend a podcast. I don't, I don't know if you can pull this one up, Harold, but it's called Visual Politic, P-O-L-I-T-I-K. Simon Whistler, he's an economist. Uh, he's British. He does a great job of, of analyzing countries all over the world, their politics, their economics, He's a wonderful podcast, and he tells you what's going on. He doesn't taint it with any political bias or anything else. He just gives you the numbers, the facts, what's going on, and what to look out for. Um, and and you know, he talks about many, many countries everywhere. But he's fascinating. I, one of these days, we're going to try to get him on a show and, and see if we can interview him because he really does do a, a very good job of putting out good information. And it's so hard to get good information yeah. out there. He, you know, without bias, he's he's good. Exactly. Um, and that so with with the Dopsy with the diabetes project, yes. what we're going to do is we'll put the when the volunteers have created the content, we'll put it on the capsules that we've already got out there. Mm -hmm. But we're also going to um, start deploying in Ghana because that oh. is where Anna is originally from. So that's going to be so a third. We'll be so that's going to be a third country. Fourth. Fourth. Which one's fourth? Which yeah. one do you have right now? You've got. Niger we've got Malawi, Nigeria, oh, Malawi. Kenya, okay. and then now um, Ghana. I forgot about right. Malawi. So, okay. Um, and and we're got, we're also hoping to start working with um, Wise Hub in South Africa. Oh. Because cool. again. Um, I've got, you know, friends, obviously, because I lived out in South Africa and I've kept some contacts there and made other contacts. And um, one of my contacts put me in touch with Theo van Linsberger, who, who's based um, in Brussels, I think, or, you know, but he, you know, he's in South Africa a lot and he's got this wise hub. And the idea is that we want to take learning to places because you know people think South Africa is a rich country mm -mm. it's only the people who've got money that are rich yeah most of the people right. are not and that yeah. doesn't matter if you're black or you're white you know it's um it the poverty crosses boundaries 
Yeah. So, and the other the other way we're expanding. I'm talking about a bit about Learn Appeal at the moment, rather than uh, learning technologies. The other thing we're going to be doing at Learn Appeal is I don't know if you remember I told you about um, a school that we're going to be working in with in London, mm -hmm. in the London borough of Southall, where yeah. it's one of London's most deprived boroughs, and we're going to the teacher there has now started sending me content and we're going to help the young people there, believe it or not, learn PE. Oh, interesting. Now, oh. Most, most young people think that PE is about jumping about a gym or running about a playing field and it's all fun. Actually, there's an awful lot of theory, a huge amount of theory. Right. And what we're going to do is make this content available because the teacher there found that in this London borough, although some of the young people have devices, their parents don't have access, mm. free access, open access to internet. So the students, if they were going to be studying online, would have to go to McDonald's or a local internet cafe or maybe a library and, you know, to go to a library uh, wouldn't necessarily always look cool. And to do your homework in McDonald's really might not look cool. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is put the capsules in the school and then the kids, the young people can access it during break time, during lunch time, during mm -hmm. after school clubs, or maybe if they've been a little bit naughty and told that they've got to just sit on their own and get on with some work, yeah, that's um, good. they will be able to accent, access the content. What was this school um, called again? Um, Villiers. Villiers. Cool. Villiers. Like great Villiers. Program. Villiers. And yeah. And I say Villiers School itself it has got a fantastic. Ofsted report, you know, it's regarded as being an outstanding school yeah. in the area, but the area that's in is in a, a, in one of London's most deprived boroughs. Yeah. So yeah. when the kids go home, I mean, the the, the fact that the, the the parents must be good parents, the teachers must be good teachers, the kids must be good kids, in order to have a school right. that gets a an Ofsted rating of outstanding. So it's not that <laughs> the people there are not good. It's just that at home, they don't, they haven't got the money to afford the internet. Right. Now right. I have a question for you. Brexit has yeah. now occurred. Do you think that's going to affect education in any way in England? No idea. No idea yet. Still too new. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because you remember we had Steve Wheeler mm -hmm. on the yeah. show. Yes. And, um, you know, Steve is a very good friend of mine. I actually saw Steve at uh, the Learning Technologies event. And Steve has just written a blog post about um, industrialization of education. Mm. Um, I you don't know. Well, I I'm not sure how I can find it. Me have a book. Oh, I can't. I can't see it at the moment. Um, but he's he's written a blog post about it, and it's about you know what is happening in the world of education are there so many i's and so many t's so many i's that need dotted and so many t's that need crossed are we in danger of industrializing our education oh, I, system? I think we're there already i think we've all industrialized yeah. and very few people come out of especially elementary and high schools come out with any skill set whatsoever the, yeah. the, in the U.S., they've taken out the trades, so you don't have people yeah. who can learn. It's so important to have trades in school. 
they they used to Absolutely. learn auto mechanics, they learned woodworking, they learned all sorts of different things. And they could get out yeah. of high school and get a job. They don't not everybody has to go to college and frankly, if you look at college graduates today, probably 75% have useless degrees. They can't get jobs with them. So it's like you know, we, we need some common sense going into, into education, and it's not there right now. Well, yeah, and especially here, useless degrees that come with the shackles of enormous debt. Oh, that the, in the U.S., we pay, uh, the average student graduates college with over 100000 in debt and sometimes 200000 and And then they it's can't okay. even get a job. You know, you no. can take a job in it's, advanced basket uh... weaving. Good luck finding a job. You know, it's just... Uh, or they take jobs in, in things that won't get you a job, uh, you know, like Spanish literature, English literature. Well, are you going to be a professor? I mean, what's, what's that going to buy you? Not much. And, and it's sort of a shame because there's nothing wrong with learning that, but to make that a career where there's no job, mm, you have to think about it a little bit. And there aren't that many openings for professors either who teach that. So these are issues yeah, that I, we but, see uh, all it, the time. It, it depends depends yeah. because my daughter um, absolutely loved Greek mythology mm -hmm. as a child. Yeah. Loved it. Really loved it. Then did it for her A-levels. I don't know what you call A-levels in the United States. Undergraduate maybe? It's almost like Is that it's school leaving certificate. It's what you do at school at the very, very end of school. The qualification that would get you into university. The qualification oh. that would get oh, you into college. We don't college. really have that. Yeah, we don't quite have yeah. A-levels here. The closest okay. thing is possibly the SAT, but that's just one and that's test. That's just it's English and quite. math. That's yeah. all that takes. Yeah. looks at so but it's um so we we have we have that yeah and um my daughter did um again she did classical civilizations mm -hmm. in as part of her a level and then when she went to university she actually studied classical civilizations at okay. university yeah she went to a very good university but when she, when she got her job, she wanted a job as a teacher, but as a general teacher, you know, mm -hmm. not history, not right. going to teach in university or whatever she wants. And in the UK, I know, I remember her father being really quite concerned that she'd done a degree in classical civilizations. Hmm. But when she was applying for jobs and she looked at different jobs, not just teaching, what the universities were interested in was the skills she had learned when she was at university. Right. The research type thing that she yeah. had done. What, you know, what groups had she been part of? Mm -hmm. How had she done academically? And she went to a very good university. And I said to her father, it won't matter what she's done what the employers are looking at is how she applied herself sure. when yeah. she was at university. No, and, and I agree with that. But what happens is that's not the norm. At least maybe for you, but not here. Uh, there's oh, okay. a lot of kids who graduate from college and they can't get jobs. There's just no jobs for them. There's, there's a lot of unemployment among college grads. Not necessarily unemployment. They can't get anything in what they studied, and they wind up in fairly low-level jobs going, I have all this debt, and I, I can't do anything with it. Uh, that's a problem we're having where the, coll and the colleges are mostly to blame for this because they're not training them to have jobs or, or anything that will one day make them self-sufficient. So I don't think it's bad to learn any of what you're saying, and the skill sets to get there are good. But... We have a very different college system here, and I don't think, and it depends on the colleges, but there's a lot of colleges that let you skate by without really having to do much of anything, and, and you just get right. that. So, so there are a lot of issues. We have issues with athletes who get a, a degree, and they've learned nothing. They've never left a field. They're just in, in the football field or whatever other field, baseball, whatever they're doing, and that's a great disservice to those kids because... They're learning how to be athletes, but athletic careers don't last that long sometimes, and sometimes they mm -hmm. don't last more than... I have a friend 
he was a football player. Uh, he went to UCLA and some other places. He got drafted by the, this is a long time ago, but he got drafted by the Dallas Cowboys, very famous football team back then. And his career ended in a pregame, one game, his knee got destroyed, and that was the end of his career. And he said, I went to college for four years and learned nothing. He had to go back to college to get a degree that he could actually get a job in later. And he wound up going into sales, and he was a very good sales guy. But he didn't know any. He goes, I never paid attention to school. I was too busy on the football field. And, and they let us get away with that. But he's one example mm -hmm. of, of, of what happens in sports. And others have gone through similar things. Or your career may only last two, three years. What do you do then? You may get a lot of money in those two, three years, but if you look at athletes, they're mostly broke by the time they're out because they don't know how to manage their money. And the people around them steal their money. So there's a lot of issues. But there's a lot of degrees that are in the arts or liberal arts, which are interesting. They're very, you, know, you don't want to lose that knowledge, but it doesn't allow people to sustain themselves later. That's just something to think yeah, about. Yeah, but then, but it depends. It does it depend. Because you could, you could be like my daughter, where her Absolutely. degree mm -hmm. taught her to learn. Yeah, yeah. And what and she did good. was learn. Anyway, to, yeah. to get back to, you know, because I'm looking at the time moving on, to get back to learning technologies, sure. there was a couple of really, really interesting um, developments. And hopefully within... Um, e-learn chat, what we'll be able to do is have some of the people on to talk about it. Mm -hmm. First one was um, women in learning. So Kate Graham is heavily involved in that. Um, Sharon, oh, I, can't, I can never pronounce the name, Sharon Khalifi -Kulby. Um So Sharon is, who is now works with Learning Pool. Um, she was also, she's US based. Mm -hmm. um, she's also very involved with that. So there's, there's quite a movement and it's not just women who are in the movement, it's men who are in the movement too, supporting women in learning. So that's quite interesting. Um, the other thing that was interesting is they picked up the Elliot Maisie concept of 30 under 30. So this year, they actually had 30 under 30. I'm just going to switch off. My, my TV has come back on. I'm just going to turn the volume down. Yep. Now, what is, what is 30 under 30? She's going to switch off her TV and then she's oh, going oh, back because she her TV okay. seems to have come on. <laughs> turned it down so the idea is now what is you before have, you go on what is 30 under 30 right so they have 30 people mm -hmm. they, they put out something before the event and they had um, invited applications from 30 young people who are under 30 mm. to put themselves forward for um, a working together mentoring program where people in the industry support them to build up careers within the industry. Okay. Oh. So the idea is to try, nurture, and encourage young talent. That's good. Are you talking strictly women or anybody? Oh, no, anybody. This oh, isn't anybody. to do okay. with women in learning. This is anybody. This is um, Elliot Maisie does it in the States. And I think because closer still, the organizers of learning technologies mm -hmm. are now, you know, are involved with them, um, with Elliot Maisie and his event. They have picked up the concept and they are now running with it in the UK. Interesting. <laughs> so I think, I mean, to me, nurturing and growing young talent in our industry you know i look back you know i look at these two programs the women in learning and mm -hmm. the 30 under 30 and i think oh my goodness i was 28 when i started working in this industry and i'm female <laughs> yep yep and it's sort of interesting because like, we've talked about this before with people we're in an accidental industry most people wind up by accident in training or learning yeah Exactly. Is, yeah. It's not. It's very rarely is it um, a career of choice. No. Nor is I it happen even... to answer. 
I answered an ad in the local newspaper. You know, the local free mm. papers that mm -hmm. they used to deliver around the doors? Yep. I answered an advert. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, uh, things are changing. And um, I'm actually surprised there aren't that many careers offered. There's a lot of instructional technology and type careers. They're too general. They don't go into enough depth of different things. We, we've met quite a few people with, with degrees in instructional tech. It's not as techy as you might think, and it's not as instructional no. as you might think. They write curriculums, but they don't write much more than that many times, at least in school. Uh, you know, it's a foundation, but it's interesting. I think they should be a lot more hands-on on some of the things they're doing, and we're still not seeing a lot of that yet. But I like the idea of the 30 by 30 and the mentoring approach and getting people yeah. some... It wasn't... wasn't um, um, Wes doing some of that, Wes Atkinson, with his yeah, business? Yeah, but that was with the e-learning e um, e network. Yes. So yeah. it was when you had Joan Keevil on. Yes, yes. She was talking mm -hmm. about mentoring yep. in the e-learning network. And Wes, uh, director of the e-learning network, as okay. was I many years ago. Yes. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, um, I mean, I when people ask me, how did you end up doing what you're doing? Yeah, I like technology, but a lot of it was to do with communication skills. If sure. people ask me what your skill is, I say my skill is as a translator. Mm -hmm. I can translate from, I can talk to senior management. I can talk in that language. Right. Talk in the, I can talk in language of HR. Mm -hmm. I can talk in the language of IT. I can talk in the language of the learner and I can talk in the language of the people who, you know, are doing the job on a day to day basis. You, you know, when you say that, you know, you're like me because I was the same way. I, I could talk to almost anybody in any corporation and, and I was yeah. more technical. And but that really paid off. And, and yeah. one thing I think they don't teach well, or at least a lot of. They're not teaching people, especially if you're going into business, to really be kind of a business analyst. Because not only yeah. are you translating, but you're really analyzing requirements, needs, and, and yeah. how, to, how to make them happen. Yeah. When I say my, my subject, when I was at what you would call college, I, you know, to me it was university, yeah. was applied business economics and marketing. You know, so it was really quite, you know, applied business economics was quite heavy. You know, it was a heavy right. subject to study sure. and marketing was all about communications. Mm -hmm. So I was combining yeah. the two then. Yeah. And that's a good combo. And that then is what I ended up teaching. But when I then got into doing stuff with technology, I was actually able to communicate with people in their language and translate what people in <laughs> IT were saying so that people in HR could understand it, translate what people at senior management were saying and translate that so that I could explain what the learners were looking for. Yeah, I, I have a, a little parable. I was watching a podcast the other day. I think his name is Swami G. He's, uh, he's actually got a master's in, I think, IT or business from India. But he decided his calling in life was, was more religious and, and he's some sort of yogi teacher um i think he's in the u.s right now I, something i read somewhere i think he's in texas but i'm not sure uh but anyway he had a great parable he was talking about and this is kind of a learning parable but he's talking about a guy he goes to a store and he buys a parrot and he brings the parrot home and the parrot doesn't seem to be doing much so he walks goes back the next day and tells the store owner the parrot seems morose. He's not happy. What do I do? And he said, well, did you get him a ladder? No. So he gets him a ladder and he gives it to the parrot. And about a day later, he goes back and says, no, the, the parrot is still pretty morose. And the owner goes, hmm, well, does he have a little pool, a little water pool for him? No. So he gets one of those and he puts it in the cage. Goes back about two days later and says, no, the parrot's still pretty sad looking, just pretty morose. 
he goes, well, here's the final. Let's get him a little seesaw, a, a little wheel that he can do things with. All right. So he puts that in there. Nothing. Nothing. He goes back about a week later and he says, oh, the parrot died. And he goes, he died? Did he say anything before he died? He said, yes. He said, isn't anybody ever going to feed me in this place? <laughs> We worry a lot about the external, but we forget about the internal. That was his whole uh, premise there. And, and it's true with learning. We, we teach people externally what they should be learning, but we don't let them bring it in and really become yeah. part of them. I, I thought it was a great yeah. one with the, with the uh, hey, parrot died. Oh, well. Did you see that? <laughs> anyway, well, with that, I think we are out of time. And yeah. Leslie, always good seeing you and talking next week. Uh, let's see if we can get one of those people you mentioned on the show next week. It'll be fun yeah. to get them on. I'll check. I don't think we have a guest next week There's lined up right now. Just to remind you, Harold, at the bottom of Leslie Peace, it needs to be learnfield.org.uk now, not learnfield. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, the lower third. The lower yep. third, yeah. yeah. Though they will both get you there, just in case you're wondering. Yes, they will. Anyway, well, Leslie, you have a... Oh, by the yeah, way, Leslie, did you, like, you liked our little Scottish girl, our new Scottish girl at home. Oh, I know. She looks so like my grandmother's dog. My grandmother's dog was called Glenn. Yeah, yeah this one's Bonnie. Was, Glenn was just oh, beautiful. This, this one is Bonnie the Collie, and we adopted her last Saturday. Uh, she's 11, yeah. almost 12 years old. She's kind of a tripod. Oh, One of her goodness. legs doesn't work very well. Um, she she kind of hops on the on the back leg. They had a surgery, I guess. Whoever owned whoever owned her took good care of her, but they took her to a doctor who didn't do a very good knee surgery. And after that, her leg oh. didn't work that well. But she is so adorable. She's very friendly, and um, very. Very, very I love collies. Dogs. We've had I think eight collies already, and it's just the sweetest breed. Uh, they're great dogs. They're just. I'm sorry, you cut out. Oh, you're cutting out big time right now. Did we lose it? Oh, uh, just about. She's still connected, but. Uh, yeah, we. Had, I think. I think we've just about lost Leslie. We can't hear her anymore. Anyway, talking about dogs and collies, they're great dogs. Um, we will... No, it's not coming in. I don't know if you can hear us, Leslie, but all we're hearing is... Very, very little. So we will see you all next week on eLearn Chat. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.